So, Sarah, I would like to welcome you to the podium. Thanks, Anne-Marie. Um, my talk today is going to be looking at the State Library of Victoria's Collection Emergency Plan and the State Library's uh, response to community need um, as it was informed by the Victorian bushfires of 2009. And although the State Library wasn't directly affected, um, and while 11 library regions were affected, um, no public libraries were destroyed. But even though none of the libraries were directly affected, there are still important lessons that can be learnt and that I hope um, we have learnt and are starting to incorporate into our planning from the point of view of both protecting collections, preparing for collection emergencies and also for helping the community in those times of catastrophic disaster. Um, I will say at the beginning that during the uh, talk I have got a video that lasts for a minute or two that um, was taken at the time of the bushfires. Uh, no one who was associated with taking the video, uh, everyone was safe after the fires, but I just warn you in case there's anyone who's had direct experience with bushfires who might um, find it a bit too much. Um, so, State Library of Victoria has um, two main buildings. It has the, for those of you who haven't been there, it has the uh, main library building in the centre of Melbourne at Swanston Street and it also has uh, an off-site store and that off-site store is um, in Ballarat which is some distance from the main library building. The collections are evenly, dis the physical collection is evenly distributed between those two sites. We have around about 95 linear kilometres of collection and so about half of it is off-site at Ballarat and half of it is on-site at the moment. We've done a lot of work over um, the last 10 years uh, and previously to that on honing down our collection emergency plan um, so that there are only really six key components and if those components are all in place then we're, um, we found that it has met every need we've had to date. The first of those, those components, as you can see listed there, are, um, and they, it's, it's interesting to listen to some of the talks this morning because I picked up on most of these issues. Uh, it's all about leadership is the first one. It's all about knowing who can talk to whom is the second one. It's all about not having to read anything to know instinctively what you need to do because you've been effectively trained. It's having the resources easily available to do it. It's being linked into a bigger business continuity management plan so you know your role uh, in terms of collections and it means that you can get external advice from other allied bodies in terms of an MOU. So just uh, quickly with um, the first point, leadership as we know in emergencies is key and so as part of our collection emergency plan we have developed a system where we have uh, three team leaders. We have an overall team leader and that team leader goes with a position within the library, the storage preservation and conservation manager position. Um, and as you'll see later, that position has a phone. The responsibility travels with the phone. So even though on a day-to-day -day basis for decision-making it's hierarchical, at the moment, that an emergency hits, whoever has that phone takes on those responsibilities. So if that person can't come in, the person with the phone takes it on. We have a response team um, and they are in charge of addressing the problems at the site of the disaster or the emergency. We have a separate recovery team and they're responsible for setting up where collection material is going to be moved to, to be treated, to be worked on. And then we have a support team that sits underneath that. And depending on the type of emergency, the size of emergency, the people that are able to be called in, the people who are available because of leave, we decide who's in what team. The second is um, the communication system that sits underneath all of that. We have um, work phones given to the key staff members, all of the team leaders have their work mobile phones as I do with me now. Um, as I mentioned before, if you get the phone with the phone number, you have the responsibilities that sit with that phone. So you're not looking for a particular person, you're not looking for a particular person in a hierarchy, a particular name. 
you're just ringing that number and whoever answers that number is able to do whatever's required of that particular position. Um, we also have honed down the numbers that are needed uh, in terms of a communication tree that need to be widely distributed into the little card that you see that uh, is designed to fit into everybody's slarge cards and it's designed for that so you have it with you whether you are at work or at home or driving between the two. Those numbers for those mobile phones are on that card. The other thing that uh, I think you can see is that on the cards it also has bullet points in terms of what your key responsibility is if you're a member of one of those teams. One of the things that we've found in the past is that people's desire to help is often not very helpful at the time <laughs> that the disaster strikes. And so with the leadership, with the teams that we have and with the leaders and with the phones and with the communication system, one of the key things is that if you are not phoned by a designated person, you are not to attend that disaster. We um, spend a lot of time training people um, in what their roles and responsibilities are. And one of the things that we had to instill in people for a lot of the smaller disasters and emergencies was you're not being helpful if you haven't been asked to attend. We don't rush in with lots of people at the beginning, all eager to help. The three team leaders go in, they assess the situation, they work out a plan, they work out who they need. We have a separate person who's a communications person who is phoning all the people on the contact lists to find out who's available and who's not available. Once the plan has been determined, we contact the communications person, that person tells us who's available, and we work out the makeup of the teams from that. So it's always related to exactly what's happening at the time. We don't have a large or even a small written disaster plan um, because as has been pointed out before, they are not referred to in times of a disaster. We do have a training manual. So we have written documentation, so someone coming in from outside, it will be quite clear to them what we're training people in, why we're training them, um, but we don't have a plan that details everything. As I should have mentioned earlier, we don't have any contact lists. The lists are all kept on the phones. So we don't have lists that are kept on people's computers that need to be accessed or that are printed out that need to be accessed. The numbers are all kept on the phones. Once a year, um, just before the Christmas break, we contact everyone who's on those teams and we find out the details. We check that their details are up to date and we also um, get information from them about whether or not they are going to be available to be called in. It doesn't matter whether they're on leave or not. Are they available to be called in in the incidents of an emergency over that Christmas break? If they're not, we know, so we don't waste our time contacting them. So we know who's around at any time. So we don't have a written plan as such, but we do spend a lot of energy in making sure that the people who are members of our teams are well trained. The idea for that is that in even quite a small emergency, and particularly in a very large or catastrophic situation, people, as we've heard this morning, are going to rely on instinct. And if their instinct is that they've been trained in what you expect of them, then you tend to get a better result, we've found. We do that by holding a mock disaster, as you can um, see. This is uh, the last mock disaster training that we held. We hold it for a day. We set up, uh, we get examples of things that are likely to be affected um, in our collections. We wet them. We set up a false store. We wet them out for about five days and then we bring people in. We have explained to them about um, the leadership structure. One of the key things is that we want the discussion about what are good or bad things to do with different types of collection materials to happen in the training. No one is allowed to question a decision of a team leader during the emergency. The idea is that you've done all that in the training and that you're, it's, um, it's sort of enhanced in you that you, you, you may not agree on the day but you know the pros and cons and there'll be a reason why that decision has been taken at that time. You don't need to be told that the reason things are being sent off to be frozen is because 
there's some other commitment to a room that you might be able to use. You don't need to waste valuable time going through all that on the day. We spend a lot of time in the hands-on disaster training to make sure that people understand what it's like to feel things that um, most of our, as you can tell, uh, disasters are to do with collection material being wet. Make sure they understand what it feels like to have collection materials wet. Make sure they understand what the logistics of actually moving material is to another space. Make sure that their instincts as to whether they'd prefer to air dry something than prepare it for freezing, they take into account the logistics of the amount of space and time that would be required for that. So all of those things that people come to um, an awareness of through the training. So we run that training of all the members of the teams uh, once every two years at a minimum. And then we do minor training in the middle of particular um, processes as they're required. The fourth uh, thing that we have, as um, I'm sure all of you have, is uh, re adequate resources. We have two disaster stores, one on site and one off site. We have uh, 35 disaster bins spread around mainly the main library building in Melbourne. Uh, the, month, the disaster bins, we have a roster and each bin is checked, including the batteries of anything that's um, like a torch that's within it. They're checked every month. So we do a stock take every month of every bin and we do a six monthly check and stock take of the disaster stores. It seems like quite a resource intensive approach when you hear about it, but the number of times that's meant that the bin that's right next to whatever's happening has everything working properly and has saved us having to run around and get something else, it's well worth it. It also means that the people who are checking the bins are very well aware of what's in them. It's not, they're not opening the bins and thinking, I wonder what's in here, because they haven't had any exposure to it. The, um, the fifth um, area is business continuity. This um, is an overall chart, the sort of, uh, I suppose it's the simplified version of our um, business, overall business continuity management plan in the same way that this little card is the simplification of our Oh, sorry. In the same way that, thank you. There we are. In the same way that um, this little card is the simplification of our communications tree. And as you can see, uh, in a similar way to as I think was originally used at the State Library of New South Wales, we have um, main functional areas of the institution. So, as well as having divisional business continuity management plans, we also have core functions and the main responsibilities and reporting structure sits underneath that plan. And so that shows how collections are one of the five main functional areas, how that links to our emergency response and how that links to our crisis management team. We also, as our uh, sixth component, our final component in our standard plan, have uh, a memorandum of understanding with the other uh, Victorian arts agencies. So that includes um, ACME, the uh, Australian Centre for the Moving Image, Museum Victoria, the National Gallery of Victoria, uh, ourselves, State Library of Victoria, and the Arts Centre. That um, formalises assistance that probably would have happened anyway in terms of uh, staff expertise, staff going to help, lending of resources, helping with uh, materials. But... Um, it means that there's no discussion or debate. Everyone knows what's available. It means that everybody knows in other institutions who they can ask for what. And it also means that as part of developing that, um, that memorandum of understanding in the group that sits underneath it, they go and visit all the other institutions. And so we're all quite well aware of what each institution's individual collection emergency plan is like who we're supposed to listen to if we're called in, uh, and all of those sorts of practical issues that you don't want to get faced with the moment that um, you're called in at midnight to someone else's uh, emergency. So all of that works, well, I think very well uh, in dealing with most of the collection emergencies that uh, have arisen at the State Library of Victoria. Um, whether it's something very small, whether it's something that's very large, whether it's happened in the middle of the Christmas holidays, whatever has occurred, uh, certainly over the last five to six years, we've been able to respond to in a very fast and effective manner. But as mentioned at the beginning of the talk, the library also um, 
as well as the main site in Melbourne, the library also has half of its physical collection located at its off-site store in Ballarat. So how, for as you probably be aware, most of all of Victoria is quite prone to bushfires. So when we were building the store at Ballarat, we had to be quite cognizant of that and to try to think of how we were going to plan in for um, the possibility of bushfires occurring. Now to give you some sense of where Ballarat is from Melbourne, those of you who are not that clear about the geography of Victoria, um, as you can see on point A is uh, the State Library of Victoria and point B is uh, the Ballarat, the location of the library's Ballarat offsite store, uh, which as you can see is uh, northwest of Melbourne. <laughs> to give you a sense of how that positions with the very significant bushfires of February 2009, Marysville that was at uh, the centre of a lot of those bushfires is almost exactly the same distance from Melbourne but to the northeast. In fact, Marysville's even closer than the store. Ballarat's 120 kilometres northwest and Marysville is 97 kilometres northeast. The Victorian um, bushfires that happened in 2009, just for us to remember how incredibly significant they were, um, they resulted in 173 people losing their lives, most of which, um, most of which occurred on Black Saturday, February the 7th. More than 5,000 people were injured. More than 2,000 homes, businesses and community facilities were engulfed. 4,500 4, square kilometres um, of land was uh, engulfed. And as I mentioned at the beginning of the talk, uh, 11 library regions were affected, but none of the public libraries were destroyed, which becomes important later in the talk. Now, I'm just going to um, give you a sense of the... Uh, fires just for a minute or so. This was um, taken in St Andrews which is even closer than Marysville to Melbourne. I haven't shown you the whole of this, the clip. Uh, a minute before this there was no fire. So that's two, min two minutes, 14 seconds in. There was no fire, no, nothing there, two minutes, 14 seconds ago. So the, um, in relation to an event like that happening, which is obviously horrifically catastrophic, we needed to, and all um, institutions, needed to think about how their existing, in terms of their collections, their existing uh, emergency plans held up. Now, while the protection of life is obviously the prime consideration there, um, there are other lessons that can be learnt. When we built our off-site store at Ballarat, we were well aware that uh, bushfires were more likely to be a problem there than in the main library building uh, in Melbourne. And so we have a lot of things that are already built in, such as fire breaks around the building, the fire panel reports directly to the Country Fire Association or authority, um, we have smoke detectors. The smoke detectors will automatically shut down the plant so the building becomes sealed and no more smoke can come in. Um, there's an automated sprinkler system, as you would expect, fed by both mains pressure and boosted by uh, electronic sprinkler pumps. There are fire hydrants. And the main walled construction of the building um, is, provides quite a good level of insulation in terms of heat. Now, since Black Saturday, 
some of the steps that we've taken so far to help uh, improve our position both for our staff and for our um, collection. The, the library store is based uh, in the University of Ballarat's campus at Mount Helen, which is just outside Ballarat. And although we run the store and we manage the staff, because they're part of that precinct, uh, we now have a situation set up where if the um, Central Weather District has um, put, a, put a code red weather day alert out, all of the staff who are associated with the University of Ballarat's Mount Helen Precinct, including uh, our staff, get an SMS code and the whole site is shut down. Once that happens, then um, the person who has the relevant mobile phone also gets an SMS at the main library site. Uh, and that means that because we've now put in a direct fibre optic link between the uh, library building in Melbourne and the Ballarat offsite store, and that's linked to our BAS system, we can automatically shut the plant down and shut the building down from Melbourne. So we don't have to wait for smoke to get into the building um, to shut the systems down, which is obviously a big advantage. We know that the university will not let any staff on, on site, so we, we don't have to worry about that. That's all part of the, the emergency processes that the university has set up. Um, we're looking at ways that we can harvest water on, uh, onto the site so that we can have ways that we can use water to protect the store uh, in the event that it's a major incident that's affecting all of the areas around it or in the event that um, the power is off. Uh, and we're also looking at um, whether or not roof sprinklers or um, um, curtains, roof uh, water curtains, are a sensible thing for us to investigate for the store, uh, both for this store and uh, because on that site we're likely to be expanding in the future for other storage uh, facilities. We want to look at how we can retrofit or build in um, all of those protections because although the construction of the building uh, walls is very good, our main risk is from ember attack on the roof. We've incorporating lots of these actions um, to take in the event of a catastrophic event into our collection emergency plan and into our training. And one of the things that we're um, trying to instill in people is that once something gets beyond a certain point, you should forget everything else that you've been told. You, these are the actions that you should take. And we found in Victoria that a number of the smaller um, historical societies and museums who had very effective collection emergency plans and who had been well trained in them instinctively went into the steps that they needed to take and they were not appropriate for an event such as um, you've just seen and they resulted in them not only putting themselves at great risk, but they resulted in, in some instances, the loss of their whole collection. So I think that one of the lessons that we need to learn is how we include in our normal collection emergency planning process or in our training process when we're um, giving advice to smaller organisations the limits of what we would normally cover in emergency training and what the next steps should be. Now, as well as looking at collection emergency response, there were also um, some very good lessons that the library learned. If I can go back to my slide presentation. Um, oh, it's up there, good. Oh, I can see down here, sorry. <laughs> um, lives, uh, lessons that they learnt um, in terms of community response. And there were a lot of actions that were taken by the State Library, by public libraries and professional bodies that provided assistance to communities that were of lasting importance. The State Library of Victoria um, responded very rapidly, although it wasn't affected itself in terms of um, fire, it responded very rapidly to increasing public requests for access to official reports on previous bushfires. Uh, within two weeks, it had digitised and provided free online access to the 1939, 1944, 1977 and 1983 Victorian bushfire reports. It had produced an online guide, um, as you can see, 
about how to find information uh, about the bushfires and with links to authoritative books, newspaper reports, statistics, photographs, websites and information about salvaging fire damaged possessions. It's a guide that is um, still online at the library. It's regularly updated and um, to date it's received over 16,000 hits and the hit numbers keep growing. We also uh, responded to individual inquiries about salvaging personal possessions via the library's uh, conservation advice line. Assistance was also provided by ALIA uh, and the Victorian public libraries. As I mentioned, none of the public libraries were directly affected. Um, and what that meant is that they played, as we've heard this morning, a key role in providing a place, uh, a safe haven for members of the community. And it's been documented by Sue McCarricker in a, in a project that she was doing for ALIA. Um, the role of libraries in a crisis situation included things like childminding when the, while the parents were off trying to find somewhere where they could, um, some accommodation, while they were trying to sort out their insurance. They provided a place of peace. They provided um, people who would listen to people who needed someone to talk to about their ordeal. ALIA's disaster recovery project also helped affected communities um, with their project Rebuilding with Books. Uh, thousands of books were donated by bookshops, uh, publishers and the public. Uh, and the Booksellers Association ran Rebuilding with Book campaign where um, if you bought a book, you could also buy a voucher to buy a book for someone who had lost um, their possessions. And Alia was instrumental in setting up all the local distribution points for these books. In terms of um, assisting with salvaging possessions, the um, AICCM, both the National and the Victorian Divisions, were very important, they worked together. They, um, the Victorian Division posted salvage advice on the AICCM website on the Monday after Black Saturday. The AICCM and the Collections Council of Australia prepared a joint press release on how to care for fi fire damaged memorabilia. Conservation clinics were run. Um, they were assisted by new volunteers and institutions throughout Victoria and in fact throughout Australia who provided both their time and salvage materials for distribution. Um, the Public Record Office Victoria was instrumental in contacting local councils to make sure that these sorts of clinics would be of assistance and where they should be located. And the AICCM bushfire uh, brochure after a fire was printed and distributed. And I think that one of the things that um, in Sue McCarricker's report that she highlights is that there is always that, um, and I think it was found as well in the Canberra fires, there's always that conflict between not wanting to go in too soon to make it seem like you're worried more about people's possessions than what they've gone through, the ordeal that they're experiencing. But as I think particularly from the Canberra fires people found was the significance. If someone could retrieve something from the fires then that item might be the only thing, the only physical reminder of what they'd lost. And so those things take on great significance. Another, um, another area um, organisation that was of great assistance was Blue Shield. Sorry. I'll keep going. Was a Blue Shield. Now, Blue Shield is the cultural heritage um, protection arm of the Red Cross, and it provided, again, uh, resources and information. And it also oh, assisted um, Alia in the production of its guide to disaster planning, uh, response, and recovery for libraries. Now, one of the really um, interesting parts of this, particularly given that some of the discussions this morning are, I'm not sure if you can see them very clearly, but some of the, sesh, the content, in the contents list, some of the sections in this guide include what your response should be when your library is unaffected. So what you can do to help the community if, you, if your library is all right. The role of libraries, use, useful supplies. Uh, 
in terms of response and also in terms of recovery if the library is unaffected, social recovery, health and wellbeing, resuming normal activities, acting as a communication hub, managing donations and res assisting with rescuing possessions. And then rebuilding, looking at renewal, looking at the balance between why we have collection emergency plans in terms of preserving keepsakes and memories, but also in rebuilding, in terms of rebuilding with books. And its final um, part of its final session on rebuilding is learning from experience. So I think that it's, it's a very interesting um, compilation of a lot of the things that we've been talking about this morning. Thank you.